begin our worship service this morning with a word of prayer, shall we? God of all creation, maker of heaven and earth, we seek your word and your discernment today. Open our eyes to see you. Open our minds to know you through your word. Open our hearts to love you and to love one another. Fill us anew with the power of the Holy Spirit and motivate us to live with Jesus Christ as our example, reflecting your love into a world that desperately needs to know you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Almighty God, we do praise you and worship you, and we thank you for your love. We thank you for the many blessings that you give us each and every day. We just thank you especially for Jesus Christ, your Son, who left his throne in heaven to take on the form of a man, to come to the earth, to die so that we may live. As we return a portion of these financial blessings back to you, dear God, we ask that you would bless these gifts and bless the givers. May they be used to glorify you and to proclaim your holy name here in our church, in our community, and throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. From the book of Psalms, chapter 124, we read, If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, If the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us, when their anger flared against us, they would have swallowed us alive. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird out of the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Now let's take a moment to reflect upon our lives and uh, the, how we have failed to be the faithful disciples and faithful servants of our Lord Jesus Christ where we have fallen short of where the Lord has called us to be. Just as each of us has one body and many members, 
And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body. And each member belongs to all the, the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is, if it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading today starts by saying, therefore. And when we see that, we, we need to make sure that we understand what it's there for. So if we back up, we can see that in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, Paul tells the reader about the glorious grace of God, or what God has done for us. Paul's epistles generally follow the format of starting with doctrine, or what God has done for us, and goes into behavior, or how we are to respond to God's grace and mercy. So for 11 chapters, Paul has told the reader what God has done. What God has done for us is to offer us the greatest possible gift, the gift of salvation, an eternity of living in God's presence in his glory. And starting in chapter 12, he begins explaining how we are to respond. In the first 11 chapters, we see some popular verses that, wrote, that sum up salvation. Romans 3.23, for example, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5.8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now these four verses are a snippet of the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And combined, they're known as the, Roman, the Romans' Road to Salvation, because in these four verses, Paul sums up God's grace and his love for us and what the sinner needs to do in order to be saved and our need to be saved. I would encourage you to read and to understand the entire book of Romans to fully comprehend the entire message that Paul has for us, but especially to be familiar enough with these four verses to explain them to a non-Christian or a Christian curious person who needs to hear it from you. We need to understand and explain that we're not saved by our own goodness or what we have done, but we're saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. So in response to these first 11 chapters, in response to this love and grace that is beyond human comprehension, how are we to respond to this great work that God has done in our lives? Paul urges the Romans, and he's telling us today that we need to live our lives dedicated for Christ. In the King James Version, Paul says, I beseech you. In the NIV that I read this morning, it says, I urge you. But I think I beseech you is a better translation. Paul is begging the reader to live for Christ. He has explained what they need to do to be saved. Now he is begging the audience to live what they have been taught. You see, it doesn't do any good to read the directions if you're just going to throw the directions away and do things your own way anyway, right? Paul has explained to them what they need to do. Now he is begging them to live it. Paul doesn't command them, and he doesn't order them, but he begs them to know Jesus Christ and to live their lives accordingly. There is only one person that the believer should be living for, above all kings, 
above all rulers, our lives should be dictated by living as if we are made in the image of Jesus Christ himself, because we are. As we read in 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Do you claim to live in Jesus? If so, then you need to live as he did. If we claim to be a Christian, yet we continue to live for the world, we're deceiving ourselves. Paul is saying, because of what God has done for us, therefore I beg you to respond in this way. Now Paul is begging because manipulation is trying to strong arm people, wears out. People who come to Christ out of fear of out of fear of hell and hellfire and brimstone, they often grow away from God after the despair fades. But the mercies of God last throughout the Bible and they last throughout our lives. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24 tells us, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his passion, his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. When we are at our worst, God is merciful. When we fail, God is merciful. Our response to the first 11 chapters of the book of, Reason of Romans, our reasonable and logical service, based upon God's mercy, is to live for Him, to praise Him, and to worship Him. Now Paul isn't talking about the kind of worship that takes place inside this church building on Sunday mornings. The worship that he is talking about here is the worship that takes place in our everyday life. Does your everyday life worship the Lord? Now as human beings, we tend to be imitators. We want, to be, we want to be accepted, and we want to fit in with our friends and acquaintances. We aren't necessarily comfortable standing alone. But as Christians, sometimes we have to make a choice. Will we live our lives imitating Christ? Or will, will we live our lives imitating the world? All people are living either a cultural or a biblical life. You can't live in both. I've described it before as standing on a pier next to a boat with one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat. Sooner or later, you're, you're going to end up in the water. You're not going to be in the pier. You're not going to be on the boat. You're going to be floundering in the water. As Christians, we have to make up our mind. Do we live for Christ or do we live for the things of the world? Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2 Corinthians 10, 5 and 6, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Paul is saying here that every thought that we have needs to be obedient to Christ. If we are to live in the will of Christ, then we have to know what the will of Christ is. Probably, that's probably the most common question that a pastor hears, is people will ask, what is God's will for my life? Any of you ever wondered that? To be honest, it's a question that many pastors, including myself, have asked. Jesus told the Pharisees in Matthew 21, 31, He said, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Jesus is telling us what we need to do to live in the will of Christ. He's telling us that we need to repent, 
and to believe. <clears throat> Repent means to turn around. It means to turn from our sinful ways and live our lives Christ-centered instead of worldly-centered and know God's Word and allow ourselves to be transformed by His Word. Then we will see and know what God's will is for our lives. In order to know God's Word, in order to know His will for our lives, we have to read our Bibles. There are no shortcuts. Those who rely upon someone else to tell them what God's Word says, as Jesus said, they're like the blind leading the blind. And then what happens? They all fall into the pit. Paul goes on in our scripture reading today to tell us not to think too highly of ourselves. In light of God's amazing grace, we can enjoy eternal salvation. But this certainly isn't because we're so smart or we're so good. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 tells us, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We're blessed because God has blessed us. We're, we are all sinners saved by grace, not by what we have done, and certainly not because we deserve it. As I read earlier, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes you and me. Paul says that we, we should think of ourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that has been distributed to us. Think seriously about yourself and your life and ask yourself, are you contributing to the body of Christ or are you a taker? We have all been given gifts in faith. And whatever gifts God has blessed us with, it's our responsibility for us to use those gifts for His kingdom. They were given to us by God, and God expects them to use them for Him. As part of the Christian community, we have a responsibility to use our God-given gifts to glorify God and to grow the kingdom. It's all His anyway, right? This wasn't a concept that was only held by Paul. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now we need to be clear and make sure that we understand that utilizing our gifts for the kingdom of God is not a salvation issue. It's a responsibility that God has given all believers. Salvation comes when we believe in faith that Jesus, the Son of God, Died for, our, died for our sins, and we accept Him as our Lord, the Lord of our life and the Savior of our soul. But we will be judged by the righteous actions that we do for God in this life in order to receive our eternal rewards in heaven. Heaven will not be the same for everyone. This is a concept that many pastors and many churches will dispute, but it's biblical. In heaven... Some people will be very wealthy and very comfortable. Others will slide in with the flames of hell laughing at their heels as they come through their gate. James chapter 1 verse 12 tells us, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Saying that our reward in heaven is the crown of life. Matthew 16, 26. For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. We will all be rewarded and judged individually based upon what we've done in this life. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. How will you be living in the city of God? It's based upon how you live in this life, whether you live for God or you live for the world. We will all receive what is due us based upon what we did in this body for God to earn our eternal rewards. We will all have eternal consequences based upon how we interacted with the Christian community and God's people in this life. Does our life reflect the attitude of love that the Lord tells us to share? Or does our life reflect an attitude of selfishness and self-gain? Then Paul goes on to list some spiritual gifts. We need to realize that the gifts that Paul is speaking about in our reading today are gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit. Everybody has been gifted in some special, unique way. We are to use those gifts to glorify God. We can get a feeling of what our gifts are by asking, what comes natural, naturally to me, or what bothers me that other people in the church or in the culture don't seem to be bothered by? If there's something that you don't like, instead of just complaining about it, do something about it. But that means standing out on our own against the opinion of the world, doesn't it? We don't like that, do we? It makes us uncomfortable. Jesus doesn't call us to be comfortable. He calls us to live for him. Remember that it only takes one person to begin and to begin to raise awareness about a situation. The gifts that Paul lists in our reading today are prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation or encouragement, giving, leading, and showing mercy. Now this is not a complete list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But it's the kind of things to give us an idea of what he's talking about. Today in our church right now, we need people with computer skills to help with the soundboard and people with the ability to help record the service and to share it on social media. Those were things that Paul wouldn't have mentioned 2,000 years ago, right? And we need people in our church to fill our committees. Paul also describes spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. He says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of worshiping, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given the Spirit is is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one, just as He determines. Everybody has been given some form of spiritual gifts, distributed through the Holy Spirit, and it's our responsibility to use those gifts to glorify God. When we're using our spiritual gifts to God's glory, we're not acting in a self-centered way. Our focus is on others. We ask, what can I do for the body of Christ instead of, what can the body of Christ do for me? What can I do to glorify God and the church? Many times pastors have heard at the end of the service, well, you know, pastor, I just didn't seem to get anything out of the service today. My response is, did you put anything into the service today? And our responsibility to use our gifts to glorify God is a lifelong responsibility. 
It doesn't quit when we retire. It doesn't quit when somebody replaces us. As long as we're breathing, we're to use what we have to glorify God. We are to continue until we hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And we need to understand that in this life, there is nothing more gratifying and nothing more rewarding than knowing that God has used you personally to reach the heart of another person and help guide them to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll share a quick story with you. Several years ago, uh, even before I got into pulpit ministry, I was uh, working with the jail ministry. I was working with the Walk to Emmaus, uh, which is very similar to uh, uh, the Great Banquet, what we have here. Uh, I had just given a talk and uh, had talked with several of the guests afterwards. And uh, somebody actually came to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and uh, had been doing a lot of good work with the inmates in the jail ministry. And I guess my head might have been getting a little bit too big because through a dream, God had a personal conversation with me. And in that dream, I was in heaven and I was surrounded by people. And every person was telling me that they were in heaven because I shared the gospel message with them. And they were all so happy to be in heaven. And they were all thanking me and congratulating me. And they were all so happy that I had shared the gospel message with them. And then suddenly all those people parted. And way off in the distance, I could see an orange flame. And in the midst of that orange flame was a silhouette. And I couldn't identify who the person was. But the voice from that silhouette said to me, as they're surrounded me, consumed by these flames, I'm here because you didn't share the gospel message with me. So when that day comes, are you going to see the people surrounding you thanking you for sharing the gospel message with them because they're in heaven? Or is the voice from hell going to be speaking to you saying, why didn't you share the gospel message with me? That's our decision in this life. In our scripture reading today, Paul is telling us to live a biblical life. He's telling us to live a humble life. And he's telling us to take seriously how we interact with God's people in the body of Christ in this life. That is our Christian responsibility. And God expects us to live up to that responsibility. Let us pray. Almighty God, open our eyes to see you in the world all around us. Make us aware of the needs of your church, that we may glorify you by being your hands and feet, and to share your word to a world that is losing sight of you. May we be a faithful body of believers, dedicated to loving you and loving one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a world full of lost sinners who desperately need to hear the message of salvation. And they need to hear it from me, and they need to hear it from you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Be His hands and His feet and His voice in a world that needs the church. Amen.